Welcome back, everyone. We're diving deep today. That's right. A deep dive into yeah. Stoicism and uh, Buddhism. <laughs> Specifically, <laughs> we're going to be looking at meditations. Well, uh, Marcus Aurelius. Right. His own, like, uh, his own personal thoughts. Yeah. It wasn't meant for publication. It was just like him wrestling right. with these big ideas. And so it makes it... Um, I feel like it makes it more real. Way more. You can really feel like the immediacy yeah. of his struggles. He was, he was an emperor, right? Yep. Roman emperor. Dealing with crazy stuff. Like plagues and wars. Oh, my gosh. And still, he's like finding time to... Uh, Sit down and be like, what is virtue? Yeah. How do I live a good life? That's that's amazing to me. And and we're going to be looking at this like through the lens of... Um, Buddhism. Buddhism. Uh, specifically, the second turning of the wheel of Dharma. Which is all about... Emptiness. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. So for people who uh, might not uh, be super familiar, can you give us a quick rundown of what Stoicism is all about? Sure. Stoicism is a philosophy that emphasizes virtue as the soul good. So it's not about like money or fame or power. It's about being a good person. Okay. Um, and they believe that the way to achieve happiness is through living in accordance with nature and reason. So nature and reason. Yeah. And they also emphasize the importance of controlling your mind because they believe that external events are largely beyond our control. Right. So it's about focusing on what you can control, like your own thoughts and actions. Okay, if that makes sense. Yeah. And Aurelius, despite being an emperor, really seemed to strive for this kind of inner virtue. He's constantly in meditations reminding himself to, you know, focus on what's truly important. So it's not like virtue is good and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> like there's actual uh, virtues, right? Yeah. They had four cardinal virtues, wisdom, justice, courage, and temperance. Okay, break those down for me. Okay. So wisdom is about seeing the world clearly, mm -hmm. uh, understanding how things really are, and using that knowledge to make sound judgments. Okay. Justice, that's about fairness and integrity. Treating others the way you want to be treated, doing the right thing, even when it's hard. Gotcha. Courage. That's not just about like physical bravery. It's also about facing your fears and um, standing up for what's right, even when it's unpopular. So like moral courage, too. Exactly. And then temperance. Temperance. It's about moderation, self-control, mm -hmm. not letting your emotions run wild. OK, so basically like having a balanced life. Yeah. Living in a way that's like aligned with your values. So it's almost like a blueprint for a good life, mm. no matter like what your situation is. Exactly. That's the beauty of it. It's a philosophy that's meant to be practical. And, you know, what's interesting is that these stoic virtues, we see them reflected in other philosophical and religious traditions, too. Like Buddhism. Like Buddhism. Yeah. Exactly. So speaking of Buddhism, can you uh, give us a little bit of background on um, the three turnings of the Wheel of Dharma, mm. specifically the second turning? Sure. So the three turnings are basically a way of categorizing the Buddhist teachings and each turning emphasizes a different aspect of like the path to liberation okay um the second turning is said to have taken place on vulture peak mountain in india and uh it focuses on the concept of emptiness which is also known as shunyata in sanskrit emptiness that sounds a bit uh abstract yeah it is a bit mind-bending at first okay but the basic idea is that things don't have, like, a fixed inherent existence. Mm. So, you know, like, let's take a table as an example. We see a table, we think, oh, that's a table. But if you really break it down, it's just a collection of wood and nails. Right. And those things are made up of even smaller things. Oh, I see. So the tableness doesn't exist independently. It's just a label that we give to this temporary arrangement of parts. So it's not that the table doesn't exist. Right, exactly. It's just we're seeing it in a different way. Yeah, it's about seeing things for what they truly are. Okay. Impermanent and interconnected. Okay. And this understanding of emptiness has, like, huge implications for how we live. It can free us from clinging to things that are always changing. That's that's interesting. Yeah. So it sounds like um, both Stoicism and this second turning of the wheel of Dharma, they're both about, like detachment yeah letting go of things that are ultimately beyond our control okay i'm starting to see the connection here yeah and that's what we're going to be exploring in this deep dive we're going to look at specific meditations from aurelius and see how they resonate with these buddhist teachings on emptiness i am uh fascinated to see where this goes let's do it let's start with something that comes up a lot in meditations impermanence impermanence yeah aurelius is constantly reminding himself that like Everything is in flux. Nothing stays the same. Right. Right. Does he have any, like, 
specific meditations about that? Yeah. He writes, Whatsoever is now present and from day to day has its existence, all objects of memories and the minds and memories themselves incessantly consider all things that are, have their being by change and alteration. Why? Heavy stuff. Right. He's basically saying that clinging to things as they are is just setting yourself up for disappointment. Yeah. Like, it's it's futile. Totally. And, you know, that reminds me so much of the Buddhist idea of Annika. Oh, yeah. Which is like the, the impermanent nature of reality. It's the same idea. Different cultures, different times, same wisdom. Yeah, that's amazing. It's like they're both saying, hey, don't get too attached to anything. Right. Because it's all going to change. All going to change. So impermanence leads to... Non-attachment. Non-attachment. Okay. Does Aurelius... Um, talk about that too oh yeah he's big on non-attachment he's always warning against clinging to external things or outcomes mm -hmm. because they're ultimately beyond our control right because if you're attached to something that's impermanent then you're setting yourself up for suffering yeah right exactly it's a recipe for unhappiness so how does um aurelius put this into practice are there like any any meditations that illustrate this idea Oh, there are tons. But one that really stands out is this. Such and such things from such and such causes must of a necessity proceed. He that would not have such things to happen is as he that would have the fig tree grow without any sap or moisture. Okay, what's he, what's he getting at there? He's basically saying that fighting against the natural order of things is futile. Like, it's like expecting a fig tree to grow without sap. It's just not going to happen. So it's about acceptance. Acceptance, yeah. Accepting that you know, things are going to happen. Exactly. And this ties in really well with the Buddhist idea of letting go of attachment to like desires and aversions, which are often rooted in this illusion of a permanent self. Okay. Both philosophies are like encouraging us to, you know, loosen our grip mm. and, and to cultivate a sense of acceptance towards whatever life throws our way. So stoic meditations on impermanence and non-attachment and the Buddhist teachings on emptiness they're like pointing in the same direction. Yeah, it's pretty amazing, right? How these two seemingly different traditions arrive at similar conclusions about how to navigate life's complexities. Yeah, it's it's pretty mind blowing. And I'm mm -hmm. curious to see uh, what other connections we're gonna uncover as we continue this deep dive. Me too. There's a lot more to explore. You know, one thing that really strikes me about meditations is how upfront Aurelius is about suffering. Really? Yeah, like he doesn't sugarcoat it at all. He's very aware that life is full of challenges. You'd think, like, as an emperor, he wouldn't have to deal with that much suffering, you know? You'd think so, right. But he's very clear that suffering is a universal experience. It doesn't matter who you are or what your status is. So how does he suggest we deal with it? Well, his reflections on dealing with adversity, they actually line up pretty well with Buddhist teachings on equanimity. Equanimity. Yeah. Okay, can you... um. Yeah, but break that down. I feel like I hear that word a lot, but I'm not sure I totally get it. Sure, sure, sure. So equanimity is basically about cultivating a mind that's not thrown off balance by the ups and downs of life. Okay. So you're not like super elated when things are good and you're not totally devastated when things are bad. So it's about finding that middle ground. Exactly. It's about developing an inner stability that allows you to respond to anything that comes your way with like wisdom and compassion. So it's not about like suppressing your emotions or pretending you don't feel anything. No, not at all. It's more about recognizing your emotions, acknowledging them, but not letting them control you. Okay, that makes sense. And you were saying this connects with Aurelius's stoic approach. Yeah, totally. He's really big on acceptance. Not in a passive way, though. It's more about understanding that there are things you can't change. Right. Right. Like you can't control everything that happens to you. Exactly. But you can control how you respond. And that's where the real power lies. I see. I see. So are there any uh, specific meditations from Aurelius that kind of illustrate this point? Oh, yeah. Tons. But one that always comes to mind is his advice on how to deal with people who do you wrong. OK, let's hear it. He writes, the best kind of revenge is not to become like unto them. Ooh. That's that's good. Right. It's so simple, but so powerful. Yeah. So instead of like getting caught up in anger and resentment, he's saying just like rise above it. Exactly. He's recognizing that like reacting with negativity just perpetuates the cycle. It doesn't actually solve anything. Nope. In fact, it usually makes things worse. And that really resonates with like 
the Buddhist idea of compassion. Oh, totally. Even towards those who have harmed you. It's about breaking free from that cycle of negativity. Yeah, yeah. It's like both Stoicism and Buddhism, they're both encouraging us to kind of like zoom out a little bit. Yeah, see the bigger picture. Recognize our interconnectedness. Exactly. So we're seeing this theme of acceptance and non-reactivity come up in both traditions. Okay, yeah. But how do we actually develop that? Huh? You know, the inner strength to stay calm amidst the chaos. That's the million dollar question, right? Well, Aurelius, he emphasizes the importance of mindfulness. Mindfulness, okay. Yeah. And that's a big one in Buddhism too. It's like the foundation of a lot of Buddhist practices. Absolutely. And while Aurelius doesn't use the word meditation explicitly, he seems to be engaged in a very similar practice, you know, self-reflection, observation of his thoughts and emotions. Right, right, like looking inward. Exactly. And he writes this really great line, Waste no more time arguing about what a good man should be. Be one. So it's not about just talking the talk, it's about walking the walk. Exactly. Actions speak louder than words. And to walk the walk, you have to be mindful of, you know, your thoughts, your actions, your motivations, all of it. Right. It's about catching yourself when you stray from your values and gently guiding yourself back on course. That's so interesting because, yeah. like, that really connects with the Buddhist idea of mindfulness as a path to liberation. Yeah, it's about, like, waking up from autopilot and making conscious choices. Uh, yeah, yeah. So Aurelius is basically saying, like, hey, you have the power to choose how you respond. Exactly. And he gives us some really practical advice on how to do that. He talks a lot about examining your judgments, questioning your assumptions, and basically seeing through the illusions that often cloud our perception. Okay, do you have like a, a specific example of a meditation where he does that. Yeah, absolutely. One of the most powerful ones is his reflection on death. Death, okay. Yeah, and he writes this really long passage, but I'll just share a snippet. He says, Let it be thy perpetual meditation. How many physicians who once looked so grim and so theatrically shrunk their brows upon their patients are dead and gone themselves? How many astrologers, after that in great ostentation they had foretold the death of some others. How many philosophers, after so many elaborate tracts and volumes concerning either mortality or immortality? How many brave captains and commanders, after the death and slaughter of so many? How many kings and tyrants, after they had with such horror and insolency abused their power upon men's lives, as though themselves had been immortal? How many, that I may so speak, whole cities, both men and towns, Helice, Pompeii, Herculaneum, and others innumerable are dead and gone. Run them over also, who whom thou thyself, one after another, hast known in thy time to drop away. Such and such a one took care of such and such a one's burial, and soon after was buried himself. So one, so another, and all things in a short time. Wow. He's like really laying it out there, isn't he? Yeah. He's basically saying, no matter how powerful or successful or famous you are, you're still going to die. Yeah. And he's using this contemplation of death as a tool to detach from all those things we tend to cling to. Yeah. Status, power, possessions, all of it. It's a good reminder that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, those things don't really matter. Right. What matters is how you live your life. Yeah. Are you living a virtuous life? Yeah. Are you cultivating wisdom and compassion? That's what really counts. And this totally aligns with the Buddhist emphasis on recognizing impermanence. Totally. By contemplating death, we can start to loosen our grip on that illusion of a permanent self. Exactly. And and awaken to the preciousness of this moment. Yeah. This life that we have right now, it's a gift. This is starting to feel like really grounding, you know, like really liberating. It's like through his meditations, Aurelius is offering us a path to navigate the the complexities of life with more clarity and wisdom. I think that's a great way to put it. And his insights, they really do align with the Buddhist teachings on emptiness. Both are pointing to the same truth. That true freedom comes from, like, understanding the nature of reality. Yeah. Letting go of attachments. And cultivating inner peace. This connection between Stoicism and Buddhism is really fascinating. Like, I'm starting to see how these two philosophies, even though they seem so different on the surface, they're both offering a similar map for navigating life's challenges and finding true fulfillment. Absolutely. And what's even more amazing is how relevant these ancient teachings are to our modern world. So true. Okay, before we get too lost in the, the philosophical clouds here, let's bring this back down to earth a little bit. How did these ideas, like these big concepts of stoicism and emptiness, how do they translate into like practical advice for everyday life? That's the big question, right? How do we actually take this stuff and like use it in our lives? Yeah, it's like easy to get caught up in the ideas and the philosophy and everything, but... Yeah. 
ultimately, I want to know how to, like, actually live a better life. Yeah. You know? Totally. And both Stoicism and Buddhism are all about practice. It's not enough to just understand the concepts. you got to actually live them. Okay. I like that. Embodiment over intellectualization. Yeah. But what does that actually look like? Where do we even begin? Well, Aurelius talks a lot about focusing on what's within our control. He says, uh, the happiness of your life depends upon the quality of your thoughts. Okay. And and it's so simple, but it's so true, yeah. you know? We can't always control what happens to us. Right. But we can control how we think about it. That reminds me of uh, the serenity prayer. Oh, yeah. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot, change the courage to change the things I mm. can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Love it. It's like both Stoicism and Buddhism are saying focus your energy on what you can actually influence, mm-hmm. your own thoughts, actions, responses. Exactly. And when you do that, it naturally leads to a sense of like acceptance and inner peace. Okay. You stop fighting against what is and you start like flowing with the current of life. That makes sense. But like, yeah. how do we actually cultivate that sense of acceptance, especially when things are like really tough? Aurelius has some advice on that too. He says, reject your sense of injury. And the injury itself disappears. Mm. He's encouraging us to really look at how we react to difficult situations. All right. Are we adding to our suffering by clinging to a sense of, like, being wronged? So our suffering is often, like, amplified by our own thoughts and interpretations of events. A hundred percent. And the Buddhist teachings on emptiness would say that we're clinging to this illusion of a separate self who's being harmed. Okay. But when we see through that illusion, we can start to let go of that grievance and find a more peaceful way of relating to those experiences. So it's about shifting our perspective. Exactly. Recognizing that like a lot of our suffering is self-created. But how do we actually make that shift? Are there like specific practices we can do? Yeah. Both Stoicism and Buddhism emphasize the importance of mindfulness. Mindfulness. Paying attention to the present moment without judgment. Aurelius writes... Nowhere can man find a quieter or more undisturbed retreat than in his own soul. Oh, wow. He's like highlighting the importance of having that inner sanctuary. Okay. A place of stillness and clarity amidst the chaos of life. That sounds a lot like meditation. It is. And, you know, while Aurelius doesn't specifically talk about meditation as like a formal practice, his emphasis on self-reflection and observation is very similar. Right. He's encouraging us to pause, to observe our thoughts and emotions, and to make conscious choices about how we respond. So create some space between the stimulus and our reaction. Exactly. And this practice of mindfulness can be applied to anything. Okay. Like you can practice mindfulness while you're eating, while you're walking, while you're talking to someone. Right. It's about bringing that quality of presence and attention to everything you do. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And I see how that connects with emptiness, too. Yeah. Because by cultivating mindfulness, we start to see how everything is impermanent and interconnected. Totally. And we realize that our thoughts and feelings, they're constantly changing. And we don't have to get swept away by them. Right. You can just observe them come and go. That's so powerful. It can be incredibly liberating, letting go of those attachments and finding that, like, deeper sense of peace and contentment within yourself. This has been a really, really insightful deep dive. Yes. We've gone from ancient Rome to like the heart of Buddhist philosophy. And back again. And yeah, exploring these these really unexpected connections between stoicism and emptiness. And what's amazing is that they both offer such similar guidance for living a good life. Virtue acceptance, mindfulness, cultivating inner peace. It's all there. So to our listeners, I encourage you to uh, keep exploring these ideas delve into meditations, check out the teachings on the second turning of the wheel of Dharma. And as you reflect on all this, ask yourself, how can I actually apply these teachings to my own life? How can I cultivate more virtue, acceptance, and mindfulness in my everyday experiences? And uh, that's it for this deep dive. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, everyone.